95% of the American people believe that we've lost something as a country. It's unclear what is a man, what is a woman? What are the norms that would shape our coming together? You have the president of Harvard University eliminating social clubs on the basis that they foster an inegalitarian spirit in Harvard. Think if you bought into an idea that it's liberating to leave an eight-week-old baby to go work 90 hours a week at Goldman Sachs, you've been had. All right, good evening and welcome everyone. Very excited uh, for you to be here for our Modern Age uh, panel on Patrick's uh, a new book, Regime Change. Uh, this is part of a new initiative at ISI to move Modern Age to the forefront of the conversations taking place in DC and around the country. So look forward to many more of these evenings with you. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to share a little bit about the history of Modern Age, in case some of you aren't familiar. Modern Age was founded by Russell Kirk in 1959, but he actually had the idea for Modern Age in 1951. And in 1951, he began to circulate a prospectus to various investors in the Midwest, and his target readership was, quote, professors, clergymen, leaders of business, men in government, and, and this is important, those reflective people in obscure walks of life who preserve the equilibrium of any society. So I will leave it to you whether you are the, uh, you know, titans of industry and the powerful men of government, or whether you are those, uh, you know, obscure people preserving the balance. But while that statement is amusing, I do think it sort of is sort of a fundamentally, it's a statement about the dignity of ordinary people, because who is preserving the equilibrium in society? It's not the elites, right? It's the populace, uh, people in obscure places who care about the most important things. So what are the principles that he said would animate modern age? It's, it's amazing how well they've actually held up since 1951. He says, the journal should have a prejudice in favor of religion, prescriptive justice, liberty under law, wisdom of ancestors, manliness in thought and society, but not being afraid to address the problems of our age. He says that the disposition of modern age would be national, even international in ambition, but it ought to have a profound Middle Western sensibility. He said America cannot afford to relinquish control of her media expression to a small circle of elites in two to three cities who cannot truly claim to speak for the whole nation. So Dan McCarthy is... He does live in Alexandria, so he is, to some extent, a creature of D.C., although I think he's, he's better than most, if not the best, in terms of, uh, you know, truly understanding the interests of, uh, of the common good, the interests of the people. He hails from the Midwest, and so I think he, he has this uh, beautiful way of bringing together these various constituencies and uh, trying to order conservatism and hopefully America towards the common good. And I think no one's better than Ben Dan and also Hannah Rowan, who's our new managing editor, to lead Modern Age in this new chapter. So we have very exciting things coming for Modern Age. We have a new Modern Age online website that'll be launching in the fall. We're gonna have a big party for that. And we have some other exciting things that I don't uh, have the liberty of sharing with you this evening, but those will be coming down the pike. So please, uh, please stay tuned. On the topic of tonight's event, uh, Patrick has been uh, a friend of mine for over five years, but even longer, a friend and a lecturer at ISI. I think he's one of the great uh, political philosophers of our day. And I was actually dismayed when someone sent me a, perhaps a, an illegal copy of his new book, forwarding you know, a, a PDF, because I knew that for the next week, I wouldn't be able to sleep and I just would have to read this book and be pondering the, the provocations uh, inside the book. Profound questions being asked about the nature of America's leadership class and restoring virtue, the common good, subsidiarity, and solidarity to America. So I think it's, it's fitting that a journal with a Midwestern sensibility would have a philosopher from the Midwest come to address us this evening. And of course, we've assembled uh, an esteemed group of panelists to respond. Um, of course, we have Senator J.D. Vance, Kevin Roberts, and Christine Emba. So uh, thank you all for being here, and I'd like to welcome uh, my colleague uh, and the editor of Modern Age, Dan McCarthy, to the stage. Thank you. 
I'm uh, Daniel McCarthy, and uh, I am indeed the editor of Modern Age. And uh, I hail originally from the Midwest. I now live, as Johnny alluded to, within uh, the DC Beltway uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, which, uh, intellectually speaking at least, is what we call a target-rich environment. I have to preface that with the intellectual uh, adjective there, lest anyone get the wrong idea here. But certainly, uh, there's plenty of injustice uh, within this city and its environs uh, to be combated and written about. So uh, I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight, and I'm really honored to be introducing one of tonight's sponsors. Louise Oliver is a woman of many achievements, not least of which is having served as chairman of ISI's board. From 2004 to 2009, Ambassador Oliver served as permanent representative of the United States to the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. She is the president of the American Diplomacy Foundation, which we are honored to have as a sponsor of today's event. Louise, uh, please come up. Thank you, Dan. It is, in fact, a great honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you all this evening. But before I say anything else, I want to congratulate you, Dan, on the extraordinary job you're doing with Modern Age. You just, it's, it's fantastic. And I don't want to stop there. Johnny, I want to congratulate you on the incredible job you're doing with ISI. It's a pleasure watching ISI just rolling along under your leadership. Now there are certain words or combination of words that can evoke an instant recognition of what they stand for. When I was at UNESCO, two words that fell into that category were Marshall Plan. Ambassadors from struggling countries all over the world kept insisting they needed a Marshall Plan. Few of them knew any details about the Marshall Plan. They didn't know how it worked. They didn't know why it worked. They only knew that it played an important role in helping countries recover from the devastation of World War II, and they were convinced that a Marshall Plan could help their countries achieve prosperity as well. This evening, the two words that are most relevant to our discussion are Cold War. Those of us of a certain age know exactly what those words mean because we lived through them those years. But what about those of you born after 1990, after the infamous Berlin Wall came down, after borders were reopened, after the Iron Curtain, so named by Winston Churchill, was lifted? What do the words Cold War mean to you? The official definition of Cold War is that it's a state of conflict between nations that does not involve direct military action, but is pursued primarily through economic and political actions, propaganda, acts of espionage, or proxy wars waged by surrogates. The state of war that the world experienced after World War II, that Cold War, was a decade-long struggle against a global revolutionary ideology, communism. A communist ideology was aggressively atheistic and anti-nationalist. Communists sought to overthrow not only governments, but also national borders and religious institutions everywhere. Faith fought back, so did patriotism. And despite communist attempts to promote worldwide revolution through military interventions and occupations, through the construction of puppet regimes, through persistent propaganda and subversion, even in the heart of the free world, the Cold War did not turn into World War III. The West won the Cold War with diplomacy, not only with the brilliant endgame diplomacy of Ronald Reagan, but with public diplomacy that spanned decades, diplomacy that focused on promoting Western ideas and culture. Our diplomacy and statecraft were effective because we were not promoting an alternative global revolutionary ideology. We were promoting freedom. Our allies in the Cold War trusted us to uphold the very pillars of civilization that the communists sought to destroy, the nation and religion. How is it then that today, 30 years after the end of the Soviet Union, American diplomacy has become so ideological 
and revolutionary in aspiration. Today, regime change is the watchword of our foreign policy establishment. And liberalism is no longer a negation of socialism or communism. Instead, liberalism now means a comprehensive cultural program to be promoted through revolution everywhere, beginning at home. We won the Cold War against communism abroad, but at home, a culture war is establishing, or has established, a revolutionary ideology in our own institutions. Those of you who participate in ISI programs and activities know what this culture war has done to our colleges and universities. The results have been disastrous for our nation, politically, economically, strategically, diplomatically, and culturally. And they've been disastrous for the world as well. America has waged wars for decades without enjoying any of the success that we achieved through diplomacy in the Cold War. And now Europe is a battlefield, and at the same time, communist China is stronger. The world needs America to recover what it lost after the Cold War, the strength to resist ideology in the name of God and country. To regain our strength as a nation, we have to bring an end to the revolutionary ideology that occupies our institutions at home. Just as Eastern Europeans and Russians brought down the revolutionary communism that occupied their nations. Patrick Deneed understands the conflict we're in. His new book, Regime Change Towards a Post-Liberal Future, turns the table on our revolutionary ideologues. This is regime change to restore our country and to restore, to restore peace and stability around the world. So please join me in welcoming, on behalf of ISI, the American Diplomacy Foundation, and Modern Age, Patrick Deneen, and all of our distinguished panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. So I will be acting as MC and moderator today. Uh, before we begin with our panel, we first will have remarks by Patrick Deneen. Patrick Deneen is the professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. He's the author of many books, including Why Liberalism Failed and his latest work, Regime Change Toward a Post-Liberal Future. With that, we'll bring Patrick up. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Johnny. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Louise, uh, for those remarkable comments. And thank you, all of you who are here tonight on a beautiful night, one of those rare nights in Washington, D.C., where you're not sweating to death uh, from, from the weather that I remember all too well. Uh, I'm deeply honored by the gathering here, uh, those of you who are here, by Senator, by President of the Heritage Foundation, Christine Emba, columnist for the Washington Post. But I would be remiss if I didn't say I was most honored by the presence, pretty significant presence, of several generations of students who I was able to mingle with. And as a teacher and someone who's maybe moving toward, slightly more toward the end of my career, this is really what gives me hope, is to have these just numbers of students, these growing number of students who I see launching into the world and having an impact. And I just want to thank you, all of you, from Princeton days, from Georgetown days, and now from Notre Dame days for, for coming out here tonight. You know who you are, and I'm really grateful. So we, we're all aware of the dynamics of the current political divide, not only in the United States, but around the world. What we've seen and what has been perhaps endlessly discussed is the rise of a kind of new political dynamic in the West, seen in various forms in Brexit, with the election of Donald Trump, uh, with uh, various movements uh, around the world, uh, uh, the recent election of, uh, in Italy, uh, resulting in Prime Minister Maloney. Uh, in other words, the rise of populism as a considerable political force in our world. And one of the things that struck me about a lot of the commentary about this phenomenon is how many people regard this as something really new, as something that we have to get our heads around because of how, how distinct uh, and sudden and incomprehensible this is at some level. 
But as someone who teaches uh, the history of political thought, who you know, spends a lot of time reading Greek and Greeks and Roman and Latin and Romans, uh, and the broad tradition of political philosophy, this doesn't seem to me to be even remotely surprising. In fact, what surprises me is that there was a time in the history of the world where we would think this is not the nature and the fundamental division of politics. Going all the way back to antiquity, if we read the works of Plato and Aristotle, and Aristotle's name I'll probably mention a few times here tonight, uh, Aristotle in particular states outright that all political regimes, and I use this word advisedly, all political orders are divided in one fundamental way between the few and the many. All political regimes have a kind of tension built into them. And that everywhere this seems to be a truth that Aristotle in his empirical, with his empirical political science hat uh, on, says that one sees this in the fact that when he looks around contemporary Greece of his day, there seem to be two predominant regime types. Democracy, which was true of his Athens where he was living and writing, and oligarchy, the regime of the many and the regime of the few. And Aristotle, if you've, if you've studied some Aristotle, you can remember back uh, to your days in introduction to political theory, Aristotle regarded both of these regimes as vicious, as reflecting a kind of vice. They weren't one of the regimes he regarded as good, uh, as, as, the, as the sort of exemplary forms of a good regime. In other words, they were not regimes, democracy, the regime of the many, and oligarchy, the regime that favors the, the few, they were not regimes that were constituted in order to realize the common good, the good of everyone in the society. They were regimes of a certain kind of party, the party of the many or the party of the few. And because of this fact, Aristotle said, because uh, this, these regimes, oligarchy or democracy, were always uh, constituted to favor some number and some limited number of people within the regime based upon typically class, it meant that these regimes were prone to two likely trajectories. And in fact, these two likely trajectories were likely to be to follow one upon the other. The first was civil war, that in the, in the pursuit of the interest of the party that governed, the other party would rise up and seek to assume power from them. Uh, and the other result was likely tyranny. Uh, that one, when one side would win, it would tyrannize over the other side. So here's an ancient philosopher, and this is a, a theme that's repeated over and over again in the history of political thought, saying that every political order is essentially destined, it would seem, to two outcomes, civil war or tyranny. And if you read the papers today, you read the op-eds, you read the columns, these are two words we see a lot these days. America is in the midst of a new cold civil war, or we are being governed in a tyrannical fashion. These very ancient words have made their way back into our vocabulary. Now, Aristotle wasn't pessimistic about this, in fact. He, he thought there might be a way uh, to, uh, to address or redress this basic problem of politics. And he said, if you have a really, if you're really blessed and fortunate, you might have a good king or you might have a good aristocracy, but those are kind of hard to find. What most regimes allow you to do is to create what he called a mixed regime, a mixed constitution, to blend the various features and qualities of the many and the few. And in this tradition, there's actually a lot of really interesting discussion of the respective virtues of the people, of the populace, and the respective virtues of the few, of those who are likely uh, to, be ben to benefit from the class advantages of being in the party of the few. The few, those who perhaps uh, reflect the virtues of the oligarchs, they tend to have more elevated taste. They like nice restaurants. If you live in Washington, D.C., even if you're not rich, you benefit from the cuisine here. I can tell you, living in South Bend, we don't have quite the, quite the selection of restaurants, not as many oligarchs. And the few that we have now work in the Department of Transportation. <laughs> the oligarchs or the few have the advantages of leisure, of education, of refinement, and of high culture. 
These are the things that are rightly admired among the aristocrats of old, or among, even among the oligarchs. I just passed the Blaine Mansion downtown on DuPont Circle, and I'm glad that it exists, even if I'm not likely to be able to buy it for, what, $30 million? On the other hand, the many, the people, I'm looking at you, JD, uh, reflect certain kinds of virtues. They're ordinary virtues. These are people who tend to be close to the earth. They, do, they know the work of hands. They often are do, do things themselves, fix their own cars, plant their own crops. They know how to make an electric circuit close. They understand the reality of limits, a world of limitation. You have to have a budget and you have to live within it. They understand often that we can't do it on our own. People who have money sometimes think they can do it on their own, but people who don't have money often have to rely on their friends and neighbors. So there are places, there are people that are often rooted and they have memory, and they often, as, as Polybius describes them, they're people of piety, maybe because of their condition of being limited and recognizing the way in which they have reliance beyond themselves. But each of these parties also have certain vices that are kind of endemic to their condition. The few find it easier to dominate the many. They just have more tools at their hands. Right? They, they can control the media. They can control the, 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 the financial system. Uh, they control the institutions, the educational institutions. They are, they are demarked by a kind of elitism, a kind of scorn or, or uh, um, condescension toward the many. They have the ability to live separately and often in far nicer places than the many. And the many, we can say, are also have their vices. They tend toward being coarse. They can become degraded, especially when they're not led by good leaders. And, then, and in such a conditions, they can be attracted to demagogues, and they can be manipulated. Their resentments can be, be manipulated by demagogues. The proposal of someone like Aristotle or Polybius or of a whole series of thinkers was to take the elements of these two groups that are found in nearly every political order and to mix them in the hopes and with the intention that the virtues of each side would counteract and cancel out the vices of each side and that this would actually have the result of creating a good political order that this would actually, because of the respective virtues of each, they would in some ways contain the vices of each. This wasn't merely checks and balances. This, this was actually a kind of aspiration to a certain kind of virtue, and a virtue that achieves a kind of moderation, a moderation now of a mixing of extremes, to use the Aristotelian language. Now, one of the hallmarks of this tradition was a stress that to create such a constitution was difficult, such a regime was difficult. But once it was realized, or to the extent it was realized, it required order and stability and literally a kind of balance. What it actually would, would, uh, would be a source of, of danger to such achievement of such a regime would be instability, rapid change, imbalance, and transformation. For as long as possible then, Aristotle writes, if one has such a regime, one should seek to continue it forward into time by retaining the balance. And in the same way that if you ever walk with like a plank on your head or something, you don't run, you walk with a certain amount of care, trying to keep it balanced as you're moving forward. Now in the book, I make the following argument and claim, and I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, this tradition as it relates to our contemporary politics. And it seems to me that there's a way in which the modern world, modern age, I'm not so sure I'm as fond of it as Russell Kirk seemed to have been. I don't think Russell Kirk really was either. That part of what constitutes modernity, and we could, we just, we could describe it in many ways, is to reject this ancient ideal of what might be the resolution of the, the divide between the many and the few and to replace it with what we might describe as a politics of progress, a politics of change, often rapid change, transformation. That rather than seeking order and stability and constancy and continuation, the modern solution to this problem of the divide between the many and the few was to promote a society that would engage in constant and even maybe constantly increasing change 
and transformation. The liberal tradition itself, beginning with the liberal tradition, overturns this ideal of classical mixed regime, mixed constitution, in favor of a modern philosophy that argues in favor of those who will bear the responsibility of generating a society of rapid and even increasingly rapid change. And the earliest of the liberal thinkers who, who proposed this was especially those who argued for this, the presence of this kind of change, especially in the economic realm. And that the elites of such a society, especially now the oligarchs of such a society, to use the Aristotelian language, needed in some ways to be protected or buffered from the threats that were posed by the many. The many who in particular would feel a threat of the change and transformation of the economic realm, as well as a certain amount of resentment toward the inequality. Thus, classical liberalism naturally finds its opponent in Marx and Marxism, right, who wants to promote the revolution of the many from below, but it also becomes suspect also of populism more broadly. Populism becomes something suspect in the view in the, in the eyes of the classical liberal tradition. And therefore, we, we shouldn't be surprised in the contemporary world and in our contemporary politics, those who we might, we might classify as classical liberals have become sort of never-Trumpers or anti-populists. Jonah Goldberg is a really good case in point, a classical liberal who would call himself a conservative, but who especially hates the way in which the promotion of the views of the many poses a threat to the to a theory of dynamic, constantly transforming economic progress. Classical liberalism then builds in a theory of how the elites, in this case economic elites, have to be the guiding force in the society and develops a constitutional order that seeks to restrain and constrain the ability of the many to interfere in the rights of property. But this is no less true in what we would today, of course, describe as the progressive liberal tradition which is also born out of an antipathy toward the many. Indeed, more than perhaps just a suspicion, an outright uh, denigration uh, and, dis uh, and a distinct kind of condescension toward the many. And this is because, to use the language of John Stuart Mill, this is because of their instinctive conservatism, their tendency to be governed by what he calls the despotism of custom. And that if society is going to become a more progressive society, a society of constant transformation and change uh, and uh, 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 upending of, 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 uh, of traditional ways of doing, thing, one, uh, doing things, one needed especially to liberate the distinctive individuals in one society. Uh, those uh, he, he praises for their individuality uh, in order to release what he regards as human, the human orientation to being creatures who are uh, who are progressive beings in their essential form. In order to achieve this, he makes the famous argument in On Liberty of, of liberating these individuals from the constraints of custom and tradition, and in particular, liberating them from the constraints of the demos. The threat of the demos and democracy as acting as a kind of restraint uh, to, uh, upon the progress of society. Uh, one of the ways in which Mill argued that this could be achieved was by plural voting, giving those who were more educated more votes, uh, thereby ensuring that progress would be ensured uh, by those who were more educated being in control of the political process. But as we know today, you don't necessarily need more votes. You just need the institutions, the cultural institutions, uh, that can in some ways serve as essentially the functional equivalent of plural voting. The result of this transformation and move away from the, from the tradition of the idea of mixed constitution with its stress upon stability and order uh, and balance toward one of transformation and constant change, a philosophy and a politics of progress, was the creation of a new divide in our politics. And again, here you students of political philosophy will recognize this. The new divide in our politics becomes the party of order against the party of progress. And those who call yourselves conservatives, or if you don't call yourself conservative, one should understand this is the origins of what conservatism was. It was Edmund Burke against the French Revolution. Right? It was Benjamin Disraeli against what he saw as the revolutionary philosophy that was a combination of the sort of bourgeois uh, uh, commercial class as well as the kind of cultural revolutionaries of his day. 
This was the beginnings of conservatism, which understood itself as bearing the tradition of this mixed constitution philosophy, the mixing of the elites and the ordinary people. For Edmund Burke, the kind of combination of the old aristocracy, the landed aristocracy, with the instinctive conservatism of the many. Right? If you read uh, Burke's thoughts on the revolution, consider considerations on the French Revolution, what does he say? The aristocracy is especially uh, responsible for preserving the way of life that's been developed organically from the bottom up. That there's a kind of responsibility of the elite to preserve the order of the society. And this is the origins of the party of order or of conservatism. And they were opposed against the party of progress, which was typically a combination of economic and social liberals. What most countries in the world call the liberal party, and which we, we uh, uh, in some ways have failed to understand that, that this combination of the social uh, and economic liberals really does constitute a single party. In the 20th century, and in significant part because of what Louise began by saying, because of particular circumstances arising from the Cold War, conservatism against Russell Kirk's desires was transformed in a liberal direction. What was called liberalism, especially in the economic sphere, became redescribed as a kind of conservatism. And we, we actually re it resulted in a kind of uniparty, a party that was consistently liberal, or even though it fought against each other in its economic guise, in its economic dimension, what came to be known as conservative, and in its social dimension, what came to be known as progressive. And this divide then became for us the political divide that represented the genuine and only political choice that we as Americans had every year. And if you're like me, you're like a, you're like me, a Catholic, Doubtless you have had that experience in your life of saying, I don't know who to vote for because they're all problematic. And the reason, the fundamental reason that they were all problematic is because they really at the deepest level were representing a liberal philosophy, a philosophy of disorder, a philosophy of instability and imbalance. In spite of the constant oscillation between these two liberal parties, one claiming to be economically conservative, i.e. liberal, and one claiming to be socially liberal. It was, in fact, the case that it was a single project that unfolded consistently over time, constantly bringing more into being the party of progress as the sole party that governed this, that governed this nation for at least the last 75 years. The economic, uh, the economic side of this, party, of this divide we called conservatism, but now I think increasingly called neoliberalism. My friend Saur Bamari shamelessly calls them neoliberals. This was originally the project of the right liberals, but of course became adopted and embraced uh, over time by so-called progressives or left liberals, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. This was the project of seeking to dismantle those conservative or stabilizing constraints upon the disorder that an unbridled economy can produce. The disordering that especially impacts those of the lower classes and the working classes. A world straddling market that was increasingly uh, freed of any kind of limitations and obstacles. And so at the risk of uh, being condemned in the way that Kevin Roberts was condemned for a recent speech, this resulted in globalization, the globalization of the economy the outsourcing of our industry, something again that Senator Vance knows all too well about, the financialization of our economy, the delinking of basic things like having a mortgage, which is all about having a home, delinking that from places and turning it into a financial product that just left one's community. And of course the opening, or let's just say the, the, the elimination of borders in any very real sense, both in terms of products as well as of course labor. And here again, with the aim of producing especially a cheap labor as well as cheap products. And at the same time, this project resulted in an ongoing form of cultural and social revolution. The ongoing liberalization of the social, uh, the social dis uh, domain. The dismantling again of those stabilizing and conservative aspects uh, over the realm of our social lives. The lives that we live responsibly in, our, in and through our communities. 
the decline of what used to be known as decency laws and norms and customs, obscenity. I mean, I grew up in a world in which F-bombs were very rare. And when someone said it, you knew they were angry or it meant something. And now it's just like a verbal tick. It doesn't even mean anything. Indecency, pornography, nakedness, public displays, not just of affection, of basically pornography, blasphemy, sexual mores, divorce, cohabitation, illegitimacy, all of these, the obstacles of the limits dismantled. Reproduction, the delinking of reproduction from, uh, of sexuality from reproduction, birth control and abortion, the disassociation uh, of our sexuality from bringing new life into the, wor into the world, and now abortion being praised as a positive good, something one should celebrate. Of course, marriage, uh, an issue over which we have struggled as a culture, but in fact, one which is actually, in spite of the apparent importance of marriage in our national debates, is actually ceasing to exist as a reality. At the very time we were having debates about what is marriage, people were ceasing to get married. And so we have all kinds of relationships. I just saw the New York Times article yesterday advising the best, city, best cities to live in if you want to have a polyamorous relationship. And now we don't even uh, increasingly don't want to draw lines on what it is to be a man or a woman, and we have uh, surgical procedures to make sure that line can be erased. This party of progress, then, simultaneously in the economic realm and in the social realm, has dismantled any remnant of what was a kind of residual mixed constitution that existed in the American tradition. And we should note and we should celebrate that this was our constitution, not necessarily our written constitution, though I don't think our written constitution contradicted this, but it was our practice. It is part of the American tradition. And this tradition that prized order and stability and balance was replaced over time by revolutionary disorder, one that prizes liberty as a kind of abstract ideal of simply free choice, disruption, and the language of progress. Once one understands this phenomenon in the light of, I think, this classical, long classical tradition and the transformation that it underwent in the modern time, I think now we can more adequately understand what we've been seeing politically in the world in the last roughly decade. What this seems to be a sudden outburst of inexplicable populism, now we understand, is in fact an inchoate and somewhat inarticulate demand by those who are at least are residually of the party of order saying, we need order in our lives. We need stability. We need balance. And we need it in both the economic realm and in the social realm. And when this movement is described as a right-wing movement, I can only laugh and chuckle. And I said, haven't you noticed they're in favor of tariffs? and the real reindustrialization of America and helping working class people get good jobs. This is really right wing. This is what right wing is now, apparently. This largely inchoate, under theorized, under philosophized reaction from the bottom, expressed through electoral, electoral preferences for Brexit and for, for Donald Trump, and now becoming more conscious and deliberate in policies, for example, by Ron DeSantis in Florida and a whole number of red state governors and many of the policies that are being pursued by the most nefarious leader in the world, Viktor Orban, who wants to shore up and support families, among other things. Notice what one sees as an effort to restore the party of order, which is, of course, anathema to the party of progress, who wants to reign supreme. It wants to reign as a tyranny. There are many people who are anticipating my book as a call to have a constant and unceasing January 6th. Deneen favors regime change. He wants to violently overthrow the government. I don't want to violently overthrow the government. I, I'm not, I want something far more revolutionary than that. <laughs> I want to overthrow the party of progress and restore a party of order that is actually the dominant party in our politics that runs through both parties. That runs through both parties. And whether that is now we divide economically over those who support a economics of order and a social order of order, 
that we see more clearly the deep connection between these two things. And this, for me, would be what constitutes regime change. Now, what would regime change look like in this form? It would be a reimagining of this mixed constitutional tradition. It's not just simply, let's take Aristotle and apply it today. That's probably not a good idea. And here's where I'm really glad to have these people here to talk with tonight, because I do have a chapter in which I make various policy proposals, and I should admit to you really forthrightly, I'm not a policy person. I can talk about Aristotle till the cows come home. But I propose things like, let's break up Washington, D.C. Let's send all these you know, various uh, you know, departments and various institutes. Let's send them out of Washington. Let's send them out to the Rust Belt towns where they could actually help our country. So that might be a, like a radical, incredible, undoable proposal. But you know, if we push the envelope a little bit, but what would, it, what would mixing begin to look like? What would a mixed constitution that would begin to mix the many and the few Placing less focus and emphasis on our elite colleges and universities and more on learning trades. More on actually having people who can do things in this country. Asking and indeed requiring people in, in otherwise elite universities to learn a trade. What would be a better argument against the Gnosticism that now dominates our academic institutions than to require students to learn how to wire a light, you know, a light fixture? It, you either get it right or you get it wrong. You know, there's no, there's no truth about this. I call this, this proposal, I call it common good conservatism because it is about um, the effort to encourage uh, and to foster a party of order. But by conservatism, I, hear, I mean of here, and I hope that you all hear this, this is not the conservatism of your granddad, perhaps, or of your father or mother, perhaps. This is a conservatism of, of even though Aristotle didn't know the word. This is the conservatism of a tradition that regards a society uh, aspiring to order and stability as that which has the potential of constituting the conditions for true virtue and, and, true, and a truly good political order. I just want to close because an awful lot of people who read my last book said, well, you don't love America. You must hate America because you, you don't like liberalism. And here I want to say in front of this really wonderful group of people, many of whom are my former students who might be wondering, does Deneen hate America? This is about recovering a deep part of our tradition. And it's not necessarily the tradition that you've been taught if you've been taught that the American tradition was always and everywhere about liberalism. That itself was a product of the Cold War. And it served a particular function at that time. But it, it elided or, uh, or hid or shrouded the kind of unwritten constitution of America, how people live their lives. When Tocqueville, I can't end a lecture without, without invoking Tocqueville. When Tocqueville comes to America in the 1830s, he marvels that the Americans have somehow figured out how to combine the spirit of liberty and the spirit of religion. These two things that in, in Europe of his time didn't seem to go together. And this is what he observes. He says, in America, the law permits Americans to do what they please. We can, we can redefine what a man or a woman is. We can redefine what marriage is. The law is basically whatever the people said, says that it is. He notices this. The law can have the potential of being limitless. He says the following, while the law permits Americans to do as they please, religion prevents them from conceiving and forbids them to commit what is rash and unjust. He goes on, nature and circumstances have made the inhabitants of the United States bold, as is sufficiently attested by the enterprising spirit with which they seek their fortune. Some things don't change. If the mind of the Americans were free of all hindrances, they would shortly become the most daring, daring innovators and the most persistent disputants in the world. These are not compliments. Innovators is not a good thing uh, in, in Tocqueville's mind. But the revolutionists of America are obliged to profess at least an ostensible re respect for Christian morality and equity, which does not permit them to violate wantonly the laws that oppose their designs nor would they find it easy to surmount the scruples of their partisans, even if they were able to get over their own scruples. Hitherto, 
no one in the United States has dared to advance the maxim that everything is permissible for the interests of society. For this is an impious adage, which seems to have been invented for an age of freedom and to shelter all future tyrants. What keeps us free of tyrants is our capacity to limit ourselves, is our capacity to, to limit our temptation to be revolutionists. And the American condition and situation makes us susceptible to that. And yet Tocqueville, observing the America of the 1830s, says they've done it. They succeeded in governing what is otherwise a constant temptation in front of them. And I would say, if we seek to conserve the American tradition, this is the tradition we should look to be conserving. I thank you very much for your attention. So Patrick's remarks um, were at a very high theoretical level. They were at a level that, um, as uh, the introductions uh, suggested, were appropriate for the literate layperson as well as for the academic specialist, whether a student or a professor. And we have among us uh, today journalists, uh, office holders, uh, thought leaders, policy experts, uh, a wide range of individuals who will help us to concretize and bring down to a uh, level of implementation some of the ideas that we've heard Patrick discuss, although we'll also hear, I think, from all the panelists, new theoretical perspectives as well. And this mixture of the practical and the theoretical is something that uh, modern age certainly aspires very much to reflect. It's something that uh, ISI as a whole uh, t tries to encourage among our students and faculty and friends. And it's something that uh, I think will be uh, you know, a, a wonderful kind of mixed regime itself here uh, on our stage. So with that, let me briefly introduce uh, each of our panelists. Immediately to my left, at least only on stage, not necessarily politically, is uh, the great uh, Senator J.D. Vance, who represents the state of Ohio, and among other accomplishments is the author of the bestseller, Hillbilly Elegy, a memoir of a family and a culture in crisis. Next to J.D. is Christine Emba. She is a columnist at the Washington Post, and she's also the author of the widely acclaimed and aptly titled, Rethinking Sex, a Provocation. Next to Christine, we have Dr. Kevin Roberts, the president of the Heritage Foundation. He earned his PhD in American history at the University of Texas at Austin, and he's the host of the Kevin Roberts Show, which is a, a wonderful podcast. So two of the themes I wanted to get into at the beginning of our discussion are, first of all, this idea of mixture and some of the divisions that we see in American society. And then secondly, uh, after that, we'll move on to some thoughts about uh, progress, what it means, what's good about it, bad about it, and your particular perspectives. So let me start by asking uh, you, Senator Vance. Um, you're someone who, in political life, has had to deal with a mixture of the few and the many, the few who are deeply politically engaged, the few who might be considered the political establishment, or for that matter, the Senate itself is obviously a body of quite a few people, uh, and also the many. You are someone who represents the great many of Ohio, uh, you're someone who, in fact, I think for Americans across the country, is a voice of the many. Uh, how do you balance in practice and in sort of the combination of theory and practice the few and the many as an office holder, as a statesman? Well, first, uh, Dan, thanks for, for doing this, and thanks to all of you for being here, uh, and thanks to Patrick, of course, for writing a great book. Um, I, I, I guess I think that things in American society are so tilted towards the few that I just worry about the many and let the rest of it figure itself out. Right, so um, I, I sort of see my, my role and my voice as being explicitly anti-elitist, explicitly anti-regime, and to the extent that we can, we can sort of elevate voices that have been largely ignored, that's the role that I play, and I think that hopefully I can play a part in that balance, uh, but that, that, I, I don't see myself as trying to concoct the balance myself. I see myself as a corrective. Uh, one observation I just wanted to make on this, this question of mixture, and it, you know, I was thinking about this as Patrick was speaking, uh, we on the right, on the, on the, the, the sort of the post-liberal right or the new right, or however we want to define what it is, this sort of hodgepodge of people uh, and ideologies that have sort of collected themselves here today, I, I think that we are really, really kidding ourselves about the weight of the challenge. And when we talk about changing the regime, which is in fact a word that I myself have used before, uh, I agree with Patrick, and I think we have to be clear-eyed about how difficult it is. And let me just illustrate this with one particular issue. One of the hangovers, one of the really bad hangovers from that sort of uniparty that Patrick Janine talked about is this idea 
that there is this extremely strong division between the public sector and the private sector. You know, the public sector, there's the necessary evil of government. We want to limit it as much as possible because to the extent that we don't limit it, it's going to do a lot of terrible things. And then you have the private sector, sort of that which, which comes from spontaneous order. It's organic. It, you know, it's, it's very Burkean. And we want to let people sort of do as much free exchange within that realm as possible. And in the reality of politics, as I've seen it practiced, the way that lobbyists interact with bureaucrats, interact with corporations, uh, there is no meaningful distinction between the public and the private sector in the American regime. It is all fused together, it is all melded together, and it is all, in my view, very much aligned against the people who I represent in the state of Ohio. Uh, I will give you a couple of examples here. Uh, one, when I talk to sort of more traditionalist economic conservatives, what, what, what Patrick would call economic liberals, when I talk to these guys about, for example, why has corporate America gone so woke, I see in their eyes this desperate desire to think that it's all just coming from the SEC, uh, that there are a couple of bad regulations at the SEC, and that, in fact, Larry Fink would love to not be a super woke uh, uh, a driver of American enterprise, and that Budweiser has no desire to put out a series of advertisements that alienate half of their customer base. They're just being forced to do it by evil bureaucrats. And there is an element of truth to that. But the element of truth to that is that the regime is the public and private sector. It's the corporate CEOs. It's the HR professionals at Budweiser. And they are working together, not against one another, in a way that destroys the American common good. Uh, that is the fact that we are dealing with. And that's something that I think we, we, have, to, we, have, to be, um, we have to be mindful of. The one final point that I'll make, somewhat related to your point, Dan, but I, it just, you know, as I was talking, I thought about this. And I have the microphone, and nobody's going to tell me to shut the hell up, so I'll just go ahead and make this point. Um, <laughs> one just sort of practical piece of guidance I'd give for, for, you know, to your point about practicality versus high-mindedness, and I'm, I'm the lowly, pre very practical U.S. senator here uh, on the stage, is I, I, I would say that, that we should be extremely mindful to something Patrick said about the real population that we're dealing with, not a sort of phantom or an abstraction or this, this idea that they're somehow perfect and that they're perfectly aligned with our politics. People are complicated. And let me just give you one example from the campaign trail. I think Patrick has heard me tell this story. I don't know that anybody else in this room has. Um, I, was, I, was at a, I was at a campaign event sort of three or four months before the election. It was after the primary. It was before the general election. And I was talking to probably a 45-year-old black woman who came up to me and told me she was pro-life, she was a Democrat, and I was the first Republican she was gonna vote for. And I remember at the time thinking, this is the very sort of person that my very intellectual new right friends think that we need to be appealing to, and they're right about that, by the way, but also think that it is a, is a natural constituency for the Republican Party. And I don't th think they're necessarily right about that, at least the Republican Party as it's currently constituted, because what she told me was not about the fact that I was more, maybe more pro-labor than the average Republican or I was more pro-working class than the average Republican. What she said, and I quote, speaking about my book, is you've been hit in the face and no other politician has. That was why she was voting for me, not because of any high-minded reason, but because she thought too many politicians were cowards and I had been hit in the face and survived it. That's, 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 who, that's, who, that's who we're dealing with. And to Patrick's point, I think there's wisdom in that approach, not just a, a, a sort of uh, lack of sophistication. I think a lot of people want to see in that woman a lack of sophistication. I think it's important we see the wisdom, but we see it with very clear eyes. So Patrick and uh, Senator Vance have both put a lot on the table. And uh, this will be truly a feast, and we'll continue to pile up higher the offerings uh, as we go on to our next panelist, uh, Christine Emba. So Christine, in addition to the few and the many, in addition to some of the other divisions that Patrick and JD have alluded to, there are also uh, the question of how you get a mixed regime of men and women. And it seems that uh, men and women have, uh, you know, both among themselves and also uh, ideologically in terms of how we even define men and women today and uh, what we see their roles as being, there is a great deal of confusion and anxiety and controversy. Um, so what do you think about a mixed regime when you think about the few and the many and when you think about men and women? What kinds of tensions do you see and what are your insights into how those tensions might be minimized or at least understood better and perhaps navigated? That is a fascinating <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, first of all, I. This is. Are we warmed up? Excellent. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, Patrick, thank you for letting me be part of this first discussion. It's 
it is a provocative book, and I know having written a provocation myself. Um, I found your work quite formative, actually. I reviewed um, Why Liberalism Failed in one of my first columns for the Washington Post. And the title of that column was Liberalism is Loneliness. And ostensibly the column was not just about the problems of men and women, but it described and referenced your book in talking about how this regime of liberalism, this individualism, this every man or woman for himself, um, has in the end left us all alone, perhaps dependent on a state who is in fact not a mate or a partner, or dependent on a free market when the things that should have been insured by our communities, our families, our romantic partners perhaps, uh, have failed. In the end, liberalism leaves us entirely alone. And I was thinking about that as I wrote Rethinking Sex and talking to so many young men and women and older men and women too um, about the problem of loneliness, which was even more a problem, I think, than our current consent-based, overly liberal sexual regime. There is clearly felt, and I think any young person in this room has felt it, can talk about it with their friends, the sense of, of breakdown that men and women, as you mentioned, Daniel, don't know how to relate to each other. It's unclear what our roles are. It's unclear what is a man, what is a woman? What should we do? How do we interact? What are the norms that would shape our coming together? Without them, we stray. We move further away. We hide away. And when you talk about sort of the the difference between the many and the few. Many researchers have noted this. The few, in fact, while promoting perhaps more liberal norms, norms that are suited to individuals with resources, indeed elites, who can experiment sexually, who don't need to have families or partners, they make enough money to support themselves, who can in fact make it on their own, those are the people who actually end up living by norms by the moral truths that were sometimes viewed as the property of the common person. But what's passed down tend to be, again, those, those trappings of individuation, these ideas that elites can suffer, but that the many will not thrive in, in following. I think when I, I think about what a mixed constitution looks like when it comes to gender, when it comes to the sexes, I think of an ideal of cooperation, of the cooperation that so many are searching for and longing for, in fact, that seems to be missing in this moment. Yes, norms supporting family formation, supporting healthy attachments, norms that suggest that, yes, you can grow something in the place that you're from. You don't have to leave and cross the country for opportunity and leave everything you love behind. There's also an understanding of roles, perhaps. And when we talk about roles, I think, especially uh, in progressive or more liberal spaces, which I tend to frequent, let's be honest, there's this idea that you'll be pushed into one. Uh, you have to fit one thing. There's no room for dissent. There's no room for personal discovery. But I would suggest, actually, that in a mixture of the many and the few, there's a view of and a vision for more opportunity, not less. There are more places that you can fit. You don't necessarily have to be a girl boss striving to succeed. You don't necessarily have to be a guy who's hyper-masculine and hyper-macho and hopped up on pornography to get girls on Tinder. There can be space for everyone in cooperation across both classes and genders. I do have one question, actually, like any good journalist professor. Um, I worry a little bit when we talk about sort of regime change and a new elite. Are we sure that we're not just replacing, again, the old elite, which is self-interested, with a new one that is self-interested in its own way? And then, of course, there's a question of sufferance. 
For all its faults, the liberal ideal is one that is actually very forgiving to people who are different, for people who maybe don't fit the norms and the mores of their locality, of their town, of the assigned gender, we'll say, or at least what are understood to be the trappings of their gender. In the new regime, are people who differ just on sufferance, or are they actually included? Often when we talk about relationships between men and women, there is a focus on family formation. We want strong families with a patriarchal father and a mom who perhaps ideally worked at home. They have kids. They do all of the normal things. What do we say to singles? What do we say to people who are gay, who are LGBT? What do we say for people who those norms don't quite fit? Where do they go in this new regime? I'm excited for the possibilities that you talk about in this book. Um, again, you might say that progressives would instantly push this away, but actually I think that there is a lot of room for agreement on questions of reforming the university so that the few come into contact with more people than just themselves uh, and increasingly arcane theories. Um, these ideas of national service, say, teaching both men and women that they belong not just to themselves, but to their families and to their nations, to their communities, to others. And this idea of Pache, I think, the old conservatives, not drowning government in the bathtub, but actually sort of getting it out of the bathtub and toweling it off and you know, feeding it up with like good vitamins so that it's fit for good use. I just want to make sure that these norms are corrigible, that they suit, yes, both men and women, but also all Americans. Those are some excellent questions, and uh, we will have Patrick respond to them uh, after Kevin Roberts speaks. Uh, I was really uh, very happy that Christine broached cooperation and uh, mentioned the way in which some of the divisions that the country has might in fact be mitigated or brought together or overcome. Uh, so my question for Kevin Roberts is going in the other direction, however, because we also, of course, have conflict in this country, uh, including conflict between conservatives and liberals. Uh, you're the leader of the premier conservative think tank in the United States. Um, and yet, you're well aware that you know, half of our country, or you know, 40 to 50% of the public, uh, does seem to be liberal or you know, leaning perhaps in a, a policy direction that may be different from what Heritage has in mind. So when you think about a mixed regime, how do you think about Heritage's mission and your mission as a leader uh, in dealing with a country that is not altogether in support of the ideas that you cherish? Great question. Well, for the record, I would still want to drown government. <laughs> I know you expect the president of the Heritage Foundation to say that, so I didn't want to disappoint you. <laughs> Not shy. Uh, I mean that. I mean that as a working class conservative. Grew up in circumstances not unlike Senator Vance's, as many of you did. A government is not the solution. And I actually believe, and not to be argumentative, uh, Dan, although you know I'm, I sometimes can be, 60% of the American people are with us on that. And, and, and Professor Deneen, you know, I'm very grateful for everything you've done. I actually think in the conversation thus far, we have, we've understated, underestimated the endurance and strength of an institutional level outside DC, our community level conservatism that isn't just the new right, although we're glad for the new right, but that's just conservative. And, and so there, that leads me to answering your question, which I, I surely don't want to evade, because it's a very good one. The country's fragmented. Heck, the conservative movement is fragmented. And so what has is, what is Heritage's approach been to that? First and foremost, to do what we've always done, which is to be part of conversations like this, to add and to multiply, not to condemn Patrick Deneen or Christine, but certainly wouldn't condemn Senator Vance, who's off to a great start in the, in the Senate. We don't condemn, period but to use our ears before we speak. And, and that leads to the second point, which is tactical, and, and I'm resisting all of the temptations to, from this early American historian to have a, a great conversation with my friend on early America at an intellectual level, and I'll stick with the practical. 
we have to acknowledge the emotion that the American people are feeling. And whether they're left, center, or right, they feel that they've lost something. They feel that they've lost the American dream. They feel, in fact, to go back to drowning the government, that government has not helped with that. And if you are a poor person who is in your 20s or 30s, you're likely to be the third generation of the so-called great society, totally misnamed war on poverty. All of that has accomplished is to erode the dignity of work and to create people who are dependent on government. I don't mean that as a zombie Reaganite, which I'm not. I mean that as someone who gives a damn about the human person. And I think Pope Paul VI had it right in Humanae Vitae when he said when you start reducing human sexuality, when you start reducing sex to just a physical act, rather than to the bonds of friendship, romance, building families and community, you hear, you hear the Burkean and Kirkian coming out, you're going to have massive repercussions socially and governmentally. Now, I know as a serious conservative Catholic that we can't go out and lead into the left of center with humanae vitae. But we do know that if we can sidestep the, the policy and political differences we have and talk to people on a human level, which is the loss that they felt, even though I might posit why they have felt that loss, and we might disagree on, on, on those reasons, we get somewhere. And, and I would say this if we weren't sitting here. I'm, I'm really grateful to J.D. Vance for legislation like the Railway Safety Act. I'm not sure Heritage is going to get there and being able to support it. I mean, and, and, and you know that we may. It may be qualified support. I'm using that as an example, and his reaction proves the point, which is that we can have conversations about this and build not just a new conservative movement, but hopefully a new country. This is where I think Patrick is so right in, in his diagnosis that I would posit, Dan, 90, 95% of the American people believe that we've lost something as a country. And one of them is the ability to sit and speak civilly, to air some differences of opinion. And so what Heritage is trying to do, first with the conservative movement, maybe a little bit into the center, and to the extent that we can, left of center, is to give people the permission space to have those conversations so that by virtue of those, those discussions, maybe by revitalizing the mediating institutions of civil society, that we can have a better political conversation. Because Washington is totally broken. And, and yes, there has to be a tremendous exertion of political power against Washington by the people against the elites. You know, my comments yesterday morning in London at the National Conservatism Conference draw that out. I, I, I learned, even though I'm halfway educated, that to use the term globalist means that you're an anti-Semite. Who knew? But we have to stand against that and say, you also are not going to control our language. This is our country. Our elected representatives reflect our virtue or our lack thereof. <laughs> and it is them who are the problem. I'm still an old-fashioned guy, Dan, as you know, and believe that politics is largely downstream from culture. But growing up on the Gulf Coast, when we have hurricanes, the bayous and rivers flow backwards. So politics sometimes can affect culture. And I think it's really important, and, and I'll sum up here, or conclude here, at Heritage, we understand we're not just waging policy and political fights, but we're also in a battle for the soul of American culture. So I have questions aplenty for Patrick myself, but rather than lobbing those at him, uh, I'd rather give him a chance to respond to the comments we've just heard from J.D. and Christine and Kevin. So I, first thing, the first thing to acknowledge is that this is, these are the first responses I'm getting to a book that I think maybe five people have read. Uh, so for me, it's extremely interesting. Yeah, I know, exactly. Uh, so for me, it's extremely interesting just to get this first feedback. And so this is uh, uh, genuinely unpracticed. Uh, and uh, in, in this sense, it's both you know, exciting but also terrifying. <laughs> It might be surprise, I think C-SPAN is recording this, it might surprise C-SPAN viewers to, to uh, hear that the person with whom I have the strongest disagreement on this stage 
is the president of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, that is to say, a notorious conservative like me finds the idea of drowning government to be absolutely an absurd uh, and frankly dangerous idea. Uh, and and not, only as a con not only as a Catholic do I say that, but also as, as a conservative or as a certain kind of conservative. I mean, you've already mentioned you know, one of those reasons, uh, which is that I'd rather have a, have, have a society in which we have uh, certain standards governing transportation and food and drugs and airlines and so forth, rather than one in which those didn't exist. And I think we would agree to that. To a degree. To a degree. Uh, but, but more than that, or even beyond those ob seemingly more obvious things, um, and I think these actually are a reflection of some things you said in London, which is that we have a society, uh, and we maybe would debate over the origins of that, but we have a society increasingly which has titanic... Uh, forms of private power, globalized forms of private power, uh, corporate power, uh, um, quasi-corporate power, massive private institutions that cannot be adequately governed or redressed at fairly local levels. Civil society uh, will not uh, suffice. Uh, state governments, you know, if you have like a company like Walt Disney, which has a valuable piece of real estate in your state, you might be able to do something with them if you're a governor. But try that with Apple or with Amazon. Uh, this gets awfully difficult to do that on a kind of local level. Now, as Catholics, we both understand the principle of subsidiarity. And for many years, Catholics, conservative Catholics, have really focused on the way that subsidiarity places a focus on the local. That the lo the the issues or challenges we face should be redressed at the most local level because that's where people have the most knowledge, the most local knowledge, the most affection and care for those issues. But this, but this teaching also directs us to understand that there are going to be issues that have to be dealt with at a higher level. Uh, we're going to need a, a senator, a U.S. senator, to talk about national uh, railroad safety standards. We're going to need national institutions to redress this. But it's especially these forms of private power. I live in the state of Indiana. Uh, I'm not originally a Midwesterner, so maybe it's even more revealing that I went to the Midwest uh, <laughs> rather than stayed on the East Coast in the swamp where I used to teach at Georgetown. Uh, that um, in the state of Indiana in 2015, uh, in the effort to pass uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act at the state level, it was the threat of economic destruction by companies like Apple uh, and Eli Lilly uh, and uh, um, the uh, e, uh, um, NCAA, not even a, not even a corporation, uh, that, that in a sense forced Indiana to reverse what was a legitimate piece of democratic legislation, duly passed by the state legislature of the sovereign state of Indiana and signed into law by then Governor Mike Pence. And I hear none of my colleagues who constantly talk endlessly about the threats to democracy faced by contemporary America when speaking of January 6th, have a peep to say about the role that these private corporations played in overturning a piece of state legislation. This is where I would say, I don't want government to be drowned. I want government to do something in those kinds of situations. It needs to actually get out of the water, get out of the bath, uh, and do something and protect, protect the citizens of, the, of that state. Now, do I want the government doing everything in our lives? Of course not. But this is where I think we need adequate prudence and judgment to determine where the right level of government should apply. Um, the, this, so I'll yeah, amend my yeah, metaphor. Okay. I want a waterboard government. <laughs> uh, that, that may actually get more controversial reaction than... Uh, I hope so. <laughs> the senator likes that. <laughs> It is. I th I, this, this actually allows me to just make one, one uh, maybe slightly awkward uh, transition to a topic that I actually talk a good deal about in the book, which is the rise of wokeism uh, and the woke corporations, uh, and something that uh, Senator Vance talked about. Um, and, and here I think um, what we, what the way in which I think um, lots of people are attempting to explain this, I think in London a lot of people were talking about cultural Marxism, uh, as, as the source of the rise of wokeism. And I, I find this explanation to be absolutely um, implausible at some level. I, I think when you see that essentially, especially the trajectory of the liberal order of, of basically disordered progress, what we're seeing is the genuine wedding, the, the, the realization of the combination of the, uh, of, of the 
sort of, let's say, progressive interests of capital and the progressive interests of the social revolutionaries. And they found this way to marry themselves to each other, as it were, uh, with uh, in and through wokeness. Uh, so, and, and it's notice that it's taking place at a particular time. And it's taking place um, at a moment when the, the visible inequality uh, and the, the condition that uh, Christine describes of, uh, in which ordinary people are really now essentially almost rendered incapable um, of, of, of achieving those basic goods of life, whether it's marriage, family, owning a home, having the expectation of having a decent job. Maybe your kid has an even better job uh, than you might or goes to a better school than you might. That kind of American dream seems to be slipping away for these people. And notice at the very moment when that became clearly visible, what happened? The most elite institutions, whether it was corporations, private entities, and in my world, the universities, become the most egalitarian institutions in the world. You have the president of Harvard University eliminating social clubs on the basis that they foster an inegalitarian spirit in Harvard, <laughs> which has an admissions rate of about you know, 4%. This is a kind of, you know, notice this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a form of sort of class warfare, as it were. That wokeism is a way in which elites in our society are using the language and appearance of egalitarianism in an effort to shroud the fact that they, have, they are actually in the process of uh, essentially using these institutions to govern in ways that constitute a kind of tyranny of progress and to actually uh, dismiss the complaints, concerns, uh, and anxieties of those who are not in those institutions of saying, you're backwards. You have, you have no standing in our society to make these complaints. You are representatives of all the various isms that we, in these institutions, uh, represent the opposite of. So, I, so I, among the things that I attempt to do in this book is to offer an explanation for the, the, the rise of wokeness as a form of explanation precisely of how the party or the, the, the kind of the despotism of progress is now using this marriage of sort of a revolutionary economic and a revolutionary social uh, um, uh, set of commitments uh, to advance its interests. It's doing what, in a sense, every corrupt ruling class has ever done, which is to attempt to keep itself in power by whatever means necessary. And this leads me, lastly, to, to Christine's very good and challenging questions, which is what prevents the, a, a successor ruling class, the regime change, uh, from being self-interested? And it's for good reason that figures throughout this tradition that I'm mentioning are not sanguine about it always uh, or even often working. Uh, that the interests of the many and the interests of few are likely uh, not to be ultimately reconcilable, but that we ought to at least aspire to make them more reconcilable. And at least the argument in my book is that the replacement of the current elites in our society ought to be more closely aligned to the interests of ordinary people. And how do we measure that? We measure that by basic sort of measures of, of sort of social and human health. The things that you were mentioning. Are we connecting? Are we forming communities, whether in the form of families? Are, are, are people able to have children and raise children? Are they able to live in communities that are healthy? Healthy and literally in the sense of not having trains, you know, train wrecks uh, and chemical spills in their towns, in their backyards, but also healthy in a social sense. And what we know is the following. The poorer you are in this country, the more you are a member of the working class, if you're not living in Washington, D.C., in all likelihood, the worse it is going for you. Life expectancy is dropping for the first time that we know in American history in this, these parts of the country. And this ought to be the topic of conversation foremost on the lips of people who are working in institutions like mine at an elite university, and yet you never hear it discussed. It's a topic that just doesn't reach the concerns of the contemporary elite. So we would, we would have to think about the formation of an elite the formation of a new ruling class that has it as its primary object and aim to make what used to be a public utility, the public utility of being able to live a good life, even if you weren't wealthy, even if you didn't have the right degree, to make that back into a public utility. And here I think we're gonna need the help of the private sector, we're gonna need the help of the civic center, and yes, we're gonna need the help of government. 
Uh, but I think that this, is, that this should be, in a sense, the, the task and the role, if this is regime change, this is the task and the role of a new elite that I hope would be a reflection of a genuinely and, and, and sort of uh, a salutary form of a mixed regime, mixed constitution. So we're going to go into a few minutes of overtime since we have a very good conversation going here. We will try to fit in one or two questions from the audience at the end, so do uh, give some thought to that. But let me turn to a second theme that came through in Patrick's remarks, uh, the theme of progress. And uh, Senator Vance, it seems as if for many of the elite, uh, progress in America to them actually means leaving behind uh, a great many Americans. And you've written powerfully about this in your own books. Uh, you've, written, you've, you've spoken about this on the campaign trail and as a senator, how do, you, how do you bring the right kind of progress to Ohio and to America uh, as opposed to the invidious and divisive kind of progress that Patrick has been discussing? Well, I, it's a very complicated question, of course, but I think one part of the solution goes to something Patrick said in his opening remarks, which is that if you look at, you know, most Americans just want a better life, and materially that's a big part of it, I think cooperation between the sexes, it's just interesting, Christine, the entire time she was talking, I'm reminded that every time I go and talk to a young group of conservatives in a college campus and the cameras are off and it's a small group, they will eventually start talking about how terrible dating is and how miserable <laughs> seemingly the men and the women are, though each in their unique ways. And it, 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 it's, you know, so obviously that's an important component of it. But if, if, you, if you look, so, so for example, one measure I think of globalization is how many of the profits are laundered through the financial sector in, in the American economy. So if you go back to 2007, 2008, about 25% of corporate profits right before the financial crisis were going through the financial sector. Well, mm -hmm. think about that, right? If you're fundamentally taking American assets, offloading them to East Asia or to Central America, that requires a much more robust financial sector than lending money to your sort of neighbor down the street. And so I think it's telling that sort of the peak of globalization, which I hopefully think was 2008, uh, you had this massive, massive concentration of corporate sector profits in the financial sector, uh, and you, you don't have nearly as much real productivity growth. And this is one area where, you know, while, while sort of, you know, Patrick and Wendell Berry make me really worried about material progress, obviously it has its downsides, I'm fundamentally a believer in higher productivity, higher standards of living, and I think that that's compatible, though it's somewhat complicated, with a social contract and a social fabric that's still fundamentally stable. Uh, but what we have in, in the modern American economy, unfortunately, is way, way too much of the so-called economic activity in financial rents, in globalization, in you know, secondary and tertiary financial products that have nothing to do with the underlying real economy. So I think part of the answer is to actually invest capital in real productive enterprises in our own country. That's the sort of thing that produces rising standards of living that I think is compatible with, with the solid social fabric. But uh, how to get there, of course, is a very complicated story. But I think that you need to make, fundamentally, you need to make it much more profitable to invest in the United States of America and much less profitable to invest overseas. So Christine, many people would say that the sexual revolution is one of the key forms of progress uh, that we have experienced in the last century or so. Uh, everything from changes uh, in terms of the roles of the sexes in work, uh, the fact that many more women work, for example, now than had done so a century ago, uh, the fact that uh, people are making a wider variety, perhaps, of choices uh, sexually than before. Uh, these forms of progress are, are celebrated by uh, not only many uh, left-wing and progressive institutions, but uh, millions of Americans seem to have uh, bought into the idea of the sexual revolution as a triumph of progress as well. I think your book is very interesting because you complicate that picture. Uh, in what ways is the sexual revolution not a triumph of progress, or perhaps a progress that may be, uh, again, perhaps is leaving behind people in ways that uh, may be overlooked by the sort of celebratory publicity that the sexual revolution often gets? Another great one. I mean, I think that first we have to really think about what progress means. And I think that there are actually a couple different definitions of progress sort of floating around that Patrick actually does good work in sort of dividing out in his book. There is what one could describe as a liberal ideal of progress, in which progress simply means moving forward. New discoveries, a transcendence of the self. Progress is transcending human limitations and human knowledge to 
find better knowledge. We're moving fast, we're breaking things, and we're ascending to a higher plane. That's progress. Or is it progress? I'm not necessarily sure. There is certainly an ideal of learning more, of having more understanding, a scientific understanding of the human person, say. Better tools to move about, to connect with each other, to determine the course of our lives in some way. <coughs> tools that contribute, frankly, to our mental and physical health. But when it comes to the sexual revolution, one also has to ask, is the progress just this idea of moving forward into a new thing? We don't know what the new thing is, but it's better than the old thing. Or progress in a different sense, which is improving the lot of the human person. Actual movement towards flourishing, towards inclusion, not away from it. And under those lights, in that definition of progress, you can see where the sexual revolution has, in some ways, gone off the rails. I mean, I'll say first that, you know, I do identify as a feminist, and I think that the original feminists had a very clear goal in mind. They wanted women to be respected and treated equally in society, seen as equal human beings to men, to have the same freedoms that men did. That was a goal. That was an important one. We're still working towards that goal, actually. But I do think you can see moments in which the sexual revolution, the feminist movement especially, were co-opted by a sort of a different revolution, a revolution of this, this first sort of technocratic ideal of progress, where it wasn't so much equality. We want men and women to flourish and become a kinder and gentler people together. But, well, we want to experiment. We want to try experiments in living. We want to have as much opportunity to have as much sex as possible to try out new attitudes, new performances, to escape consequences through technology, uh, through the removal of norms that protected the majority of the people in the past. And, well, the outcome is what we have today. The crowds of young people surrounding J.D. Vance after his talks <laughs> complaining about the dating scene. And, of course, as discussed before, the the loneliness, the lack of relationship, the pain that so many people see. I think that we need to be focusing more on a progress that is actually human, a progress towards a goal, a progress towards the good, towards flourishing, towards a better society, not just progress for progress's sake or progress for economic sake. So the idea of the sexual revolution as freeing women up to work more, freeing men up to work more and have more casual sex in their free time when they're not working. I don't think that that's progress. I also want to note that these definitions of progress are often confused in criticisms of wokeness. I think that wokeness, or the phrase, the word woke especially, is just used too often as a boogeyman to sort of cast a pall over some actually very important things. I think even activists in, in spaces uh, for people of color, for women, complain about their movements being co-opted by capital. But movements for progress, the progress of women being respected as much as men, progress that looks like black people being seen as equal to white people. Those are actually important movements. They aren't just wokeness. They aren't just critical race theory, which is maligned but mainly misunderstood. They actually do mean something. It's fair to criticize when they're used by elites to turn attention away from their misdeeds, but it is actually wrong to ignore the real progress, the human progress that is being made. Real quick or something Christine said. So um, I'm, I'm 38 years old. We have three kids under the age of six, and we have a lot of young women uh, with families in sort of our peer group. And something I've seen multiple, multiple times with well-educated women who are very oriented and focused on their career 
is they'll have kids and they want some period where they can step back a little bit from their career and focus on their families. And the incredible and immense social pressure applied to those women for just wanting to take maybe six months off from work and spend time with a new baby is incredible. And the idea that that's progress, that this is somehow liberating. I mean, if, if, if you think, if you bought into an idea that it's liberating to leave an eight-week-old baby to go work 90 hours a week at Goldman Sachs, you've been had. And I think all of us have been had a little bit by, by that idea. He's up. Uh, what I wanted to ask uh, Kevin Roberts, which is, <laughs> you, uh, you, you're the leader of a conservative uh, think tank, a conservative policy shop, and yet uh, there must be forms of progress that Heritage itself would like to embrace. How do you, uh, you know, sort of separate what is uh, virtuous and good about progress, including some of the points that uh, Christine brought up, from the way in which progress has lately become uh, a sort of uh, deliberate move away from everything traditional about America. What's the right balance to strike? Another great question, Dan. Um, and not, to, not at all to be flippant, it's just going to be succinct. Progress is exemplified by increasing the dignity of the human person. The example that JD just mentioned for new moms or moms-to-be struggling with that, that would be an example. And I think where, where Patrick is, is so right and has been right for many years is reminding conservatives of any stripe that whether in politics or policy or culture, society writ large, what we need to be focused on is the human person and on the community. Th those are some of the eternal things that conservatism has always been about, at least since Burke. And there's a long, long tradition in American history through the post-Cold War area up to this day that maybe it's not as ascendant as it once was, although I think it might be now. All that to say, at Heritage, we also believe that in order to create the space in which individuals, communities, new institutions, reformed institutions can help further progress, can help improve the dignity of the human person, that we do have to get government out of the way. All jest and all jousting aside, whatever metaphor we want to use with the bathtub, <laughs> I'm a conservative, not a libertarian. Heritage is a conservative institution, no modifier in front of it. I think it's redundant to say common good conservatism because conservatism is about the common good. But I don't mean that to be a gratuitous criticism of Patrick because I'm very grateful for what you're doing and you know that. It's to say this, we also have to step out of theory and philosophy and we have to be zealously focused on putting a dagger in the heart of the thing that stands in the way of the dignity of the human person, and that's the American administrative state. That's what's got to be drowned. And so... <laughs> at 12.01 p.m., January 20th, 2025, when we have a conservative president, whoever he or she is, Heritage has no dog in that fight, many very beautiful dogs, <laughs> Very beautiful. Are they in the bathtub? <laughs> Set you up, Christine. The most, the most With the seen. most beautiful. <laughs> that person, we hope, will, as they're taking the oath of office, be grateful to this republic, be grateful to a conservative movement, not just heritage. I don't want heritage to take credit for this, although we played a role in it at providing the best, most comprehensive presidential transition project that is focused on what? Not just diminishing the scope and size of the administrative state, which exemplifies the, the, what, what Patrick and, and JD have said. It's that that's the means to the end. The end is self-governance, and that's what's standing in the way. And, and I'm just hopeful, and I will conclude on this because I know you're looking at your watch, Dan, that wherever we are, whatever tribe we're in, and the center-right, the American Solidarity Party, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, feminists, whatever tribe you're in, that you realize we still have time to take back this country. Please, wherever you are, whatever books you like, whether you like heritage or not, whether you want to waterboard or drown, government. <laughs> Do not despair. 
It's just we have to be busy about all of these things we're talking about. Before I turn to Patrick with a last question for myself, I want to alert our ISI uh, folk with microphones <laughs> to uh, be on standby because we will uh, take a question or two from the audience uh, when we conclude. But Patrick, I wanted to turn back to you, uh, not just on the theme of progress, but also this idea of a mixed regime. One of the things that makes Alexis de Tocqueville so brilliant is the fact that he is living after a revolutionary age. France has had a revolution. Then uh, in Tocqueville's lifetime, you've had a restoration of monarchy. There are some forces in uh, restored France that want the monarchy to be much stronger. They want it to be as powerful as it had been under Louis XIV, for example. And there are others uh, in the restored monarchy uh, under which Tocqueville's living who want to have a second French Revolution. And of course, you have uh, you know, uh, military folks who uh, perhaps want a Napoleon Bonaparte to, uh, or his, uh, his heir rather, Napoleon III, to come to power. But one of the things that makes Tocqueville brilliant is this mixture of old and new, revolutionary, post-revolutionary, and pre-revolutionary. My question for you is, America's had a cultural revolution, it seems. America has experienced these liberal transformations you've discussed. Is it the case that uh, what you envision is a return to an earlier pre-revolutionary condition, or will a post-revolutionary condition be one that has to combine some of the aspects of the liberal order that you've described with the mixed regime that you want to bring about? Yeah. So the subtitle of the book is Toward a Post-Liberal Future, and that, that phrase uh, or word uh, is chosen with, with some uh, care and, and, uh, and forethought which is that it's not a, simply a going, it's not a going back. It's not an effort to say, well, in order to restore a, you know, a better America, we have to go back to 1950 or 1980 or 19, I'm not sure what the period would be in early American history that uh, uh, we would point probably to. Probably Im impolitic for me to answer that. Yeah, it would be probably. <laughs> uh, in other words, that there's, there's a, there is no going back. Time doesn't work that way. Uh, but also, we've lived through this liberal revolution. And, you know, Christine points out aspects of it that I think, you know, certainly as a Catholic and as a human being, I would regard as good. I mean, I, I, I you know, you read the treatment, obviously the treatment of, of African slaves in this country and then the treatment in the Jim, Jim Crow world. And there's, I, you know, maybe there are people who want to go back. I hope, you know, I, I genuinely hope that whether you describe yourself as a conservative or as a liberal or progressive, this is not what's wanted. Uh, there's no wanting to go back to, to that kind of condition, and I certainly don't. And here, I would credit, uh, whether we describe it as liberalism, whether we, we describe it as a kind of, you know, the, the realization of a, of a more fully Christian understanding of, of the ideal of human dignity, there's no, there's, certainly in my view, there, there ought not to be any going back. But what we should also notice, and I think, Christine, your comments really do point to this, is that often these you know, genuine um, achievements in the American political, cultural, social order are framed in terms of this kind of revolutionary uh, depiction. It's framed in terms of an overthrowing of all that previously existed, that it is a part of a recidivist worldview, all of which has to be overcome and transcended. So when I'm speaking especially and critically of progress, I'm speaking of a kind of ideology of progress that regards the past, regards that which preceded us as a kind of blighted time, as a time, a time of darkness and ignorance, of superstition, uh, the kind of the, dark, the, the, the black myth as it's called, as sometimes described, not not, uh, not, uh, it's described as a kind of, or the black legend, I think it's described, as a kind of time of, of ignorance. And I think the, I, this, this ideology of, of progress is precisely what, among other things, Tocqueville feared that would become dominant in America, which is that it would make us, in many ways, ignorant of what the future actually might hold. In other words, the ability to have a kind of much more a prudential understanding of how it is we are to act in the world, where one uses certain features of the government or the private sector and so forth, require us to bring to bear all of the knowledge of the past of history uh, without, in some ways, being dominated by it. Right? Not to be a nostalgic, uh, but at the same time, not to be an ideological progressive who simply sees the past as this 
as this time that simply needs to be over, overturned and overcome. I, so part of, part of the book, and at the end of the book, um, I talk about the need in some ways that this post-liberal future will be one in which we sew together time. And this sounds awfully theoretical and philosophical. We sew together time. But it's with a very, you know, it's with a very practical purpose uh, that we have the ability to understand the goods of the past as well as the bads of the past. A genuine ability to see and assess those things in order that we can live responsibly into the future. The ideology of progress in many ways relieves us of the responsibility of living, responsibility, of living responsibly into the future and thoughtfully into the future because we tend to just have the view the future will take care of itself. Or a phrase that one often hears, you can't stand in the way of progress. In other words, it renders us incapable, weak, and um, uh, just, just, uh, sort of just simply uh, makes us powerless in the face of what are supposed inevitabilities. And in the, in the interest of a kind of genuine human freedom, we have to have the capacity to say certain things that we might regard as a change or transformation are going to be good. Precisely, you know, is transhumanism the good that we want? Right. Are driverless trucks the good that we want? You know, are, are there simply things that we're going to, uh, are simply going to be inevitable? Or do we have the capacity to exercise judgment? And here I think progress functions as a kind of ideology that makes it difficult for us as a civilization to actually deliberate over these kinds of questions. Well, one good that everyone will want is a copy of Patrick's book, which is going to be on sale <laughs> after the event. Uh, let's take a question from the audience. Uh, we will go over there in the edge. And please keep questions brief so that we can get one or two in. Yes. Th thank you to the uh, panelists and especially Professor Deneen. You've been instrumental in my philosophical development. Throughout the, uh, the speech, you, you sort of uh, dr painted liberalism as a philosophy of instability. Uh, as sort of corrosive on, on social, uh, healthy social forms. On the other hand, uh, a thinker like Rawls, especially in his later work, views uh, liberalism as sort of stability admits, admits pluralism. So uh, liberalism as sort of this bulwark, uh, this stable bul bulwark against a, a sort of a, a threat of chaos if, if a particular, a partisan vision of the good were to take hold in society especially American society. So what do you make of this challenge of pluralism and how do you view post-liberalism or you know, common good conservatism as, as sort of answering this challenge to, to provide a stable future? Yeah, I know we're, uh, we've been very patient, so I'll just be very brief. And I, I would, since you indicate you've, you've read some of my previous work, I would simply point you to the last book, Why Liberalism Failed, which is really the effort to show that the claim that we can have a kind of neutral or contentless liberal society was always you know, basically a myth and even a lie. That of course it has a content. And we're seeing that content sort of visibly before us. It's a kind of enforced indifferentism at some level, which is you are required not to care. You are required to have no judgment. And if you have judgment, if you think something is right or wrong, you are no longer to be permitted in, in polite conversation. So it has actually a content, and that content becomes, becomes dominant. And in fact, it becomes the, basically the form of the regime. So we're in a situation in which it's not a debate between a contentless neutrality and conceptions of the good that we have to debate over. We really are in a situation where we have to debate over conceptions of the good. And I'd rather be in that debate. And I would frankly rather have conservatives, however we describe ourselves, in that debate and not simply say, you know, we just want to live in a neutral society in which there is basically fundamentally an agreement that we just disagree. Let me give uh, Christine and then Kevin uh, an opportunity for a last word, either in response to that question or in response to other thoughts that have occurred during tonight's uh, discussion. I'm going to toss that to you, Robert, actually. OK, sure. I was going to say ladies first, but uh, that's just the Southern gentleman in me. Yeah. Is that patriarchal? The sexual revolution is Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're, we're eating away the clock, Christine. I'll say two things. The first is the heart of the conservative is gratitude. And I'm grateful to Patrick Deneen for his career, for his work, for his book that I read on the plane back from London last night and, and I enjoyed. We have 
a thousand times more things we agree on than we have differences of opinion on. I'm most grateful for how you mentor your students. You, you personify what professors should be, and you're a friend of the Heritage Foundation. We have differences of opinion, but that's okay. The second thing is, I just, in my heart, I would say this, even if I were not the president of the Heritage Foundation, you need to tithe to the American Republic, every single one of you in this room. And my takeaway personally from this conversation is I, I think Professor Deneen would agree with this, to tithe to the Republic, to tithe to the post-liberal new regime, if that's your preferred language. But please consider working in the next administration. I mean that. Because if we don't do that, if all we're doing is giving our time, talent, and treasure to church and civil society and nonprofits, all worthy, don't get me wrong, that may not be enough. I think the lesson, or one of the many great lessons of the new right, of the work that Patrick Deneen and others have done that, that ISI, of course, always champions is we are in an era of needing to impose political power as conservatives. And one of the ways we can do that in a relatively cheerful daily way is to be part of an administrative state that will be smaller as a result of what, of what you're doing. Project2025.org. <laughs> Uh, well, to the question, very briefly, I think I'll echo Patrick in saying that I, I'm not sure that the difference is between liberalism and total chaos. I think actually one of the most interesting things about uh, the book that you'll get to read is the description in which actually there are common norms, common sense, mores that have existed across time and persisted in that actually contain some wisdom. That's not chaos. Uh, it may not be written up by Rawls, it may not be political philosophy, but there is knowledge there. And in fact, liberalism is often standing directly in contrast to that. Um, so that's the question. Uh, as a closing note, I think I'll bring out one thing that actually JD mentioned, uh, Senator Vance, um, but that I think is always under discussed. The idea of a mixed constitution, this post-liberal future, the mix is important. Hmm. We spend a lot of time talking about elites and how elites must reform themselves and elites need to have better ideas about how to run the country and elites this and elites that. You know, I'm a Washington Post columnist. I'm talking to an endowed professor and the head of a think tank at a university. I just want to correct the record. I don't have an endowed chair, but maybe as a result of this oh. book, I might. <laughs> All right, fingers crossed. We're, we're manifesting. Self-interest. <laughs> but it's, it's easy enough to gather in rooms like these and think about how we should fix the world and make it better and have those discussions stay here. A real mixed constitution means moving out in the world and not just moving from Catholic University to, you know, the reception across the street from Catholic University to like the popular cocktail bar on 14th Street, but actually interacting with the people, with seeing those people as valuable in their own right, with viewing them not as enemies because they are on the wrong political line or are of a different skin color or belief system, but actual members of the populace who have wisdom to share, who we are in community with and are bound to serve. There's often uh, a feeling of wanting within the elites to just come up with like a solution so that we can help the people who are experiencing falling life expectancies, help those people out there whose lives are falling apart. We just like, Let's come up with a good idea and give it to them. No, we have to be them, in a sense, and they are us. And I think that is actually one of the, the most important things to remember in this movement as we talk about how to reform the regime. It has to be one that is actually inclusive in a real way. So I am very grateful to our panelists and to our audience. I'm also very grateful to ISI President Johnny Bertka, who has a final thought for us. Thank you, uh, speakers, and Patrick, uh, and Dan and Luis for sponsoring the event. The last uh, plug that I have for you, first and foremost, do get a copy of Patrick's book on your way out the door. And second, on the back of your programs, you will see a QR code, an ad for ISI's homecoming weekend. So this is two and a half weeks from today at our beautiful 20-acre uh, campus uh, and estate. Uh, we have a, a great time. It's not just 
panels. We have jazz band, we have oysters, we've got dancing. It's a fun uh, time of community and friendship, and we have great speakers, uh, including Lee Edwards, H.W. Brands, Chris Buskirk, and we'll be exploring the question of the great uh, statesmen, artists, uh, and creators that have made this country. So please uh, uh, sign up, and if you're under 30 years old, it's only $50, and it's an hour and 10-minute train ride from D.C. So see you in two and a half weeks, and thanks again. Thanks.